I would make this saying, and let me say it to you and see how you react. Okay. I would say Americans live in the future. They're always just like mm. planning ahead and thinking about the future. Europeans live in the past, always <laughs> thinking about their history and Africans live in the present. That's true. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that that's true. But it's very much as, again, it's like it's going to be all right. You know, right now you have food in your belly. You are not that cold. Like, chill, you know, you can sort it out tomorrow, which is great in a certain extent. But I feel that actually the right balance is being able to live in the present while still catering for the future and honoring your past. That's why I think what it, all we are striving um, to do here in this world. Right. It reminds me of. And I don't know why, and for those who are still pondering what I said about the, the three different cultures there, there's a U.S. president, I think it was Truman, who had a sign on his desk on the, in the Oval Office, and it just said, history is bunk. Actually, I don't know if that was Truman. Now I'm thinking about it, it could have been Henry Ford who actually said that. Um, the only thing that matters is the history that we make today. You know, history is bunk. Bunk is bullshit, right? So... <laughs> So, and that, and that kind of is the American spirit who cares about the history. I don't care mm. where you came from, where you immigrated from or who your parents were, how much money you used to have. What can you do for me today? And in the future, what can we build yeah. to, for the, for the next day? And, uh, and, 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 uh, Europeans, they're so obsessed about their, of the historical, uh, you know, like all their great history and, you know, that they they, and they talk about Americans don't have any history. And, um, <laughs> and of course, Africans don't have any history either, even though we all came from Africa. <laughs> so it's like, and then, but it is fascinating. What about, let's go on to South Africa. Now, mm -hmm. South Africa has built a wonderful reputation of being xenophobic. And <laughs> <laughs> is that true? Because you have Mozambicans, Zimbabweans, Nigerians, to some extent, Namibians, and of course, Nigerians who have immigrated, but people all over Africa have yeah. gone to South Africa because it is uh, the, one of the strongest economies in, in Africa to go there for economic opportunity for the same reason that you have many Latin Americans who try to get into the United States or Canada yeah. and they're chasing economic opportunity. And, and why North Africans are taking boats across the Mediterranean Sea to go into Europe. People, you know, human beings chase economic opportunity. And here you are, you are a Mozambican yeah. who crossed over the border, probably illegally in the middle of the night, I'm sure. <laughs> no, I'm <just> I wish. <laughs> no, no, it was like all a straight process, man. <laughs> I'm just kidding you. I know. So... <laughs> so so tell me about, but how were you, how are you received? Mm. Um, and I imagine it's a big difference between somebody who's very educated and well-spoken like yourself yeah, versus a Mozambican who does sneak in across the border in the middle of the night <laughs> and who's just <laughs> trying to sell, and who's trying you know, to sell peanuts in the, in the streets of Johannesburg, right? Um, I try to be very considerate when I'm saying those things and not like to be politically correct, but because I mean, if you are seeing the video, I'm mixed. Uh, people usually look at me and they don't figure it out where I'm from, especially if I don't open my mouth. And even when I do, I have people in Mozambique that cannot, they, for them, I'm Brazilian or Angolan or something else. So usually it's very easy for me to blend in. If I were to go to North America and say like, bro, I'm from New York, from the Brooklyn's, what are we going to say, you know? Um, so <laughs> I feel that every time people interact with me, there is this uh, added layer that I might be local or not. And actually happens here all the time. I go to and ask for information and people start speaking Zulu immediately. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm not South Africa. And they look at me like, huh, you're one of those. They don't want to honor their local language. I'm like, no, no, I really am <laughs> not South African. I, I, I promise you I'm not. I can show you my passport. Um, so I guess with me in particular, it's quite different. And I'm quite privileged for being mixed um, and sort of like I can literally say for any country that, oh, my mom is here and my dad was black and people will buy it, you know? Right. Um, but with that said, I found that here in South Africa, most of the attacks were around the having not that much opportunities looking from the inside out, and then a lot of those opportunities being um, taken by foreigners, even though those foreigners were actually qualified. So there was this sense of sort of internal unhappiness with how the economy was for them as South Africans, and then the internal fight within the different um, races in South Africa, so the colors, the whites, and the blacks, and they're sort of like bleeding into other um, into other nationalities. So it's a, 
it's quite of an interesting topic that I feel that's not like there's no easy answer. And if you look in specific case of South Africa, they come from a very, very a harsh story around the apartheid, where you know black people were evil, uh, but also the stuff that was done. To them. So it's like a it's there's a whole lot of healing to be done. I'll put it that way. Does it make sense to you? Oh, it makes complete sense to me, and that is why I really, uh, you know, South Africa to me is such a troubled country because those wounds are so fucking deep and they and went for so really long gonna, yes and it's going to take a long long it's going to take many decades for them to heal if ever and you know i hope I obviously at some point they will but i just think it's it's one of the most difficult things and so what you're suggesting maybe let me julio let me see if i'm hearing you right okay are you saying that because of the colonization that happened and the apartheid it made people excessively tribal because it put people into categories of colored black white uh in some cases indian right and so and they became very protective and tribal of their whatever tribe that they happened to be thrown into and then once they became liberated in 1994 when mandela took over then those things stayed behind. And so even though, and so then they took that tribalism and imposed it as well as to people from outside the country, from the Nigerians who are coming, from the Mozambicans who are coming, from the Zambians who are coming. And so that tribalness said, okay, we're going to look at those others. And so very, very tribal. Is that fair or am I off the bar? I think you hit the nail when you said that uh, after Nelson Mandela took charge, it wasn't like automatic and then of the sudden all South Africans are equal. And I don't want to speak on behalf of any South African, but from my perspective, looking in, it's not like it wasn't automatic, you know, a lot of even the systems today when there is, um, I think they call it here, the BEE or the black participation enterprises that you have to have in South Africa. There's black a lot of economic to- empowerment. Exactly. Thank you. Black, so there's a lot to be sort of like said and done around how, how the country evolved from that culture, you know, because Sorry. it's like, let me just interrupt. So BEE, which is Black Economic Empowerment, for those uh, U.S. citizens mm-hmm. who are listening to, it's similar to affirmative action in the United States, where there's preferential treatment based on your racial background, effectively. Uh, so there, the government gives either loans or assistance of some sort for Black-owned uh, businesses and and tries to help prop up and give certain advantages to black and then also to hire black employees uh, to give preference to them to try to right the historic wrongs where whites had advantages for well over 100 years 200 years of advantages and so they're trying to uh, fix that with this black economic empowerment exactly thank you very much for that uh, Francis, and I feel even that, like how that works, and you know, making sure that you're not only just you're not being hired because of your skin color, but being hired because you also have the skills. But also, how do you ensure that, uh, send, uh, you know, a certain um, people that didn't have access for so long for just basic education, how will they be able to meet those criteria? So I really think it's more of complex than we assume and that we think. And they're sort of really bleeds in into many other things. But if there is one thing that I believe that South Africans did very right, it goes around customer service because of that differentiation. Uh, I mean, I, I've actually, I was like one of my clients that they were training um, waiters and hotel staff to a five-star hotel in Italy and five-star hotel in other parts of the world because because of so much separation that happens here in South Africa, you really need to be able to cater for um, a white woman who wants, you know, stuff delivered on time, but you also want to cater to a black man who wants to be treated fairly. And you also want to cater for a colored man who doesn't want labels necessarily, but also doesn't want, uh, you know, to be in prison and want to have the freedom. Uh, So I think most of the time we tend to focus on how bad that thing is and how bad South Africa still is. And we forget all the amazing things that they were able to build, even within that context. And yes, of course, sometimes things do bleed, um, you know, from uh, a race conversation into a nationality conversation, unfortunately, but there's still so many great things to be acknowledged about the South African nation. If that makes sense to you. Yes, it does. And thank you for pointing out because I confess that I tend to be too negative on South (laughs) Africa on average. No, it's true. It's just... 
I, I had such a great time traveling all over. So I started in Morocco and mm. went through West Africa and then went down to the west side of Africa, all the way down to South Africa. And I was having a wonderful time the whole way through. And then I get to South Africa. I was like, huh? In some ways, I loved it because, of course, it's so rich and developed and has wonderful infrastructure, etc. On the other hand, just the vibe I got was not African. <laughs> it was not an African vibe, which in general, I say that in a very positive way. African vibe is so much more, it's welcoming, it's warm, it's loving, it's relaxed, friendly, it's relaxed, it's stuff like that. In, in, in South Africa, I just felt this kind of tension. And, and I felt it with the blacks, with the whites, with the colored, with everybody. It's just like, I, I'm saying this, this is a huge generalization. It's yeah. true. But 